Hi everybody, this is Marlene with the Erie News and today is September 28th, 2022. September 28th, 2022. It's Wednesday and for those of you, uh, we have a Hurricane Ian is raging, raging across Florida. But uh, let's get on to the news of the unusual. All right. The first story that we have is out of Erie News, and it's titled, It's estimated that about 300 people were killed each year in Bolivia's Camino de la Muerte. The gravel path starts in the Bolivian rainforest and snakes along 43 miles of the most harrowing, dangerous stretch that for good reason is known as the Death Road. The official name is Carretera de los Yungas, or North Yungas Road, located in La Paz, Bolivia, and every factor that could contribute towards a kamikaze ride is present. Landslides, hairpin turns, year-long blinding fog and steep cliffs with drop-offs of 2,000 feet. In the summer, extreme dust clouds churned by other vehicles inhibit visibility of where you're going and what's coming towards you. There are places where waterfalls land on its surface. Paraguayan prisoners of war were used in the 1930s to cut the route into the unyielding mountain to connect La Paz to the town of Coroico with plans to use it to transport goods. Even then, only small vehicles could be used, as right turns don't allow for larger trucks. The road is no wider than 10 feet, which is why many trucks loaded by merchants with people and livestock went down off the side. There is no asphalt for tires to grip, only gravel and dirt with no guardrails to halt the progress of a vehicle that has lost control especially when rain makes it muddy and slippery. In 1946, 26 persons were killed when a truck plunged down a 500-foot cliff into the Pampapaya River. In 1960, a truck traveling to La Paz for Palm Sunday services slid off the mountain road into a ditch. 37 were killed, 15 were injured. On July 24, 1983, a bus veered off and fell into a canyon. More than 100 persons were killed. It is considered one of Bolivia's worst road accidents. This proved that even drivers who lived in the area and were supposedly experienced was no guarantee against a disaster. For those who are not natives, there is also the danger of the thin air. In 1961, Reverend Murray Dickinson, who had been ministering in Bolivia since 1943, was found dead in his car. He was 46 years old and was presumed to have died from the effects of high altitude. He was en route from La Paz, where he lived, to the Yungas Valley. In 1999, eight Israeli tourists died on the road, which is when it was named the Death Road. While the rest of Bolivia's drives on the right side, on this thin road, vehicles drive on the left. This allows a driver a better view of the edge of the road. Vehicles heading down must yield and move to the outer edge. Many times, passing can only be negotiated with both vehicles stopping first. Crosses in a macabre decoration line the road as memorials to those who never reached their destination. Once you leave La Paz, the road climbs a mountain pass known as La Cumbre to 15,260 feet above sea level as you traverse 43 miles before you come to a steep descent down to nearly 4,000 feet. Despite its notorious reputation, it has become a tourist attraction, especially for thrill-seekers and adrenaline junkies. In 2009, a new route was opened to connect La Paz to Coroico with two lanes and guardrails. However, Yungas Road is still used mostly by backpackers, local workers, and bike tours, which accounts for most of the recent deaths. More than a dozen cyclists have died in the last 10 years. Many of the times, they do not have enough time to break before they are hurled into a fall of thousands of feet. The road has many names, which are Death Road, Groves Road, Coroico Road, Camino de la Yungas, El Camino de la Muerte, Road of Death, Unduavay Yolosa Highway, Ruta de la Muerte. It is not surprising that a roadway known for its many deaths is replete with ghost stories. Those that live in the area and traverse it often describe hearing voices laughing and crying. It is told that a trucker who regularly traveled on the Yungas Road came across an old man walking along the road. The man made a signal asking for a ride. The driver stopped, saying that it was a cold day full of fog, and he felt sorry for the hitchhiker. Once inside, the man starts telling him his story, where he worked, who he was, and how much he loved his wife and children. An hour later, the man asked him to stop because he said they had come to his home. 
The old man then took off his coat and gave it to the driver, who had left his home without one. All he asked was that it should be returned when the driver came back on his way home. The driver delivered his cargo and, as promised on the return trip, stopped at the traveler's home. He followed a winding trail that ended in a small house that appeared to be uninhabited. He knocked on the door, but no one answered. After waiting a bit, he turned to leave when he saw two crosses. At that moment, a young man came around the house and asked him, Who are you looking for? Since he didn't know the old man's name, he described the hitchhiker. The young man started to cry. The trucker asked, Why are you crying? The other replied, the man you described is my father. He died two years ago, along with my mother. They were returning from a trip where they had gone to sell coca leaves. The truck they traveled on rolled off the road and everyone inside was killed. The trucker could not believe that the man who had written with him was a ghost. Another phantom that is regularly seen is a red dog that passes in front of vehicles many times causing an accident. In the Sudyungas, there is a haunted castle known as El Chaco, or El Castillo del Loro, built for one-time president of Bolivia, José Luis Tejada Sorzano. It was constructed during the Chaco Wars from 1932 to 1935. Unlike the death road, it was built by Paraguayan prisoners of war. For many years, it stood desolate and unoccupied, except for a caretaker. There were reports of footfalls in the hallways and doors that opened by themselves. One of the ghosts is supposed to be Tejada Sorzano himself, he was removed from power by a coup d'etat in 1936. Exiled in Chile, he died two years later. Sorzano's mistress is also supposed to haunt the place. Left behind, she allegedly killed herself when she learned of his death. The property was later brought from the Sorzano heirs and converted into a hotel with an ecological reserve surrounding it. A Castillo del Loro is close to the small town of Chulumani, which is known for its healing mineral springs. The town square is a trade center, for the farming communities in the area. Another ghost is said to be Klaus Barbie, the Nazi war criminal who lived in the sawmill above the town after he fled Germany in the aftermath of World War II. This property also belonged to that Tejado Sorzano family. During the 1950s, a certain Klaus Altman worked there as a supervisor. His true identity was Barbie, known as the Butcher of Lyon. He was discovered in 1972. Another source of the haunting is said to be the souls of the Paraguayans who built the castle and the death road and died and were buried in the surrounding jungles. A caretaker who lived during the years it was unoccupied reported that while in the kitchen he would hear whistling coming from the dining room. Scared to go investigate, he stayed in the kitchen. He said the ghost would whistle louder and louder as if upset that he was being ignored. Another time, while he slept, something came to lie on top of him and then he heard steps and a door open and close as he entered left his bedroom. During the time it had become a hotel, a group of friends and family came to stay there. The first night, nothing happened, but the second night, everything changed. One of the young ladies claimed she felt someone watching her when she was taking a shower. Later that night, while the group was standing in the foyer, the light started to blink and then went out. One of the girls screamed and said someone had touched her shoulder. She pulled back her shirt where scratches ran across her skin. Later they studied photographs taken and found the transparent form of a woman in the background of several pictures. Some wondered if this was Sorzano's deserted mistress. So there goes the story of the death road. And of course there's always going to be adrenaline junkies who think that's a great idea. But personally, just looking at the pictures, and, and, and I don't have a problem with heights, but just looking at those pictures goes, uh, nope. Not for me. The uh, next story is out of vice and it's titled Science is Baffled by Perfectly Geometric Polygons of Cyclones on Jupiter. Uh, at the poles of Jupiter, enormous cyclones swirl in neat geometric patterns that stay stable for years at a time, a phenomenon that remains unexplained and as scientists have said hints at the need for new physics. The hurricane force storms were first discovered by NASA's Juno mission which has captured unprecedented observations of Jupiter since it arrived in orbit around the planet in 2016. In the planet's northernmost region, a central cyclone is located near the pole, while eight others dance around it at lower circum circumpolar latitudes in an octagonal pattern. In the south, a similar cluster of five cyclones form the shape of a pentagon. Now scientists led by Andrew Ingersoll, 
who serves as Earl C. Anthony Professor of Planetary Sciences at the California Institute of Technology, have shed new light on the strange forms that encircles Jupiter's North Pole, each of which is about as large as its continental United States. The results suggest that an anticyclonic ring of winds that blow in the opposite direction of the cyclones is needed for the stability of the polygonal pattern, though the team noted that other questions about the storms remain according to a study published in Nature Astronomy. Since 2017, the Juno spacecraft has observed a cyclone at the north pole of Jupiter surrounded by eight smaller cyclones arranged in a polygonal pattern. The researchers said in the study it is not clear why this configuration is so stable or how it is maintained. The polygons and the individual vortices that comprise them have been stable for the four years since Juno discovered them, the team added. The polygonal patterns rotate slowly or not at all. In contrast, Saturn has only one vortex, a cyclone at each pole. To get a firmer read on how the polygons form and then remain so steady, Ingersoll and his colleagues measured the winds and dynamics of the extraterrestrial tempest with Juno's Jovian Infrared Auroral Mapper, Gyram, instrument. Gyram is able to spot details of the poles down to scales of 180 kilometers or 110 miles, a resolution that exposes a torrent of winds that acts as a kind of brace for the cyclones, which is the key to their stability. However, what the team weren't able to see in the observation is as consequential as what they did spot. The researchers noted that they did not find the expected signature of convection, the process by which heat is transferred through churning fluids, in contrast to previous research according to the study. Ingersoll and his colleagues said the future work is needed to reconcile these conflicting data sets, noting in their new work that a parallel study of Jupiter's south polar vortices focusing on vorticity and stability presents a step in the right direction. These beautiful geometric storms are just one of many mysterious processes on Jupiter that scientists are hoping to probe with missions such as Juno or the newly launched James Webb Space Telescope. As the solar system's biggest planet, Jupiter has no lack of bizarre and unique phenomena, but it can also serve as a model to understand similar observations on other planets, including Earth. These cyclones are new weather phenomena that have not been seen or predicted before, said Cheng Li, a Juno scientist at the University of Michigan, Ann Arbor, and a co-author of the new study. Nature is revealing new physics regarding fluid motions and how giant planet atmospheres work, he said. We are beginning to grasp it through observations and computer simulations. Future Juno flybys will help us further refine our understanding by revealing how the cyclones evolve over time. And I think this is fascinating because, you know, you know I know that it takes X amount of time to get probes or anything to these places. And it's very unusual. And I understand, like, how is this produced to, you know, to, to, to allow for that pattern? And how how do they maintain it you know so yeah I, I love to to read stories like this because you know you hear these probes being sent out to outer space into our solar system and sometimes it takes years and years for them to get any feedback but once they do it provides information like that well then on to our next story this is something unusual this is out of Anomalian and it's titled the man who filmed the giant on the mountain died under mysterious circumstances. Uh, something strange and gloomy happened to Canadian Andrew Dawson, who posted a video with a giant on a mountain on his TikTok accounts in early summer 2022. First he was stalked, then he made an embarrassing admission that his video was a hoax, and then Dawson died. A mysterious giant figure on a mountain in Alberta, Dawson noticed by chance while driving to work with a colleague. He filmed the figure on video and posted it on the internet. The video quickly became popular. Dawson, meanwhile, became obsessed with solving the mystery of the giant on the mountain. He thought he had videotaped a yeti. He returned to the mountain, but did not see anyone on its slope, and when he wanted to go up the mountain, someone influential forbade him to do so. Then Dawson began to be followed by someone. He began to notice suspicious people in a car near his house. He decided that he had filmed something that no one should have seen, and that now he was being pursued by people from the CIA. It ended with the fact that one day he posted a video in which he made a confession that his video with the giant was only a hoax. This gave rise to a lot of talk, but then the story of Dawson began to be forgotten. The other day, one of the netizens 
studied the history of Dawson, found that Andrew Dawson had passed away. An obituary for him from his grieving relatives was posted on July 1, 2022 on websites in his region, and judging by the date, Dawson died shortly after he made the confession to the hoax. When information about this hit social networks, many remembered that Dawson's video confession looked very suspicious. The man was definitely nervous and kept looking to the side as if there was someone who was ordering him what to do. It is not known what Dawson died of, but his death was apparently sudden. There are even theories about suicide, but in the video, he looked like a vigorous and quite healthy looking man, strong and caring for his appearance. After the confession video, Dawson posted two more videos, one titled, I'm Scared, and the second shows the same mountain where he filmed the giant on which Dawson noticed some kind of structure and asked the question, military? Before posting a video with a giant on a mountain, Dawson was quite an ordinary blocker. Posted a lot of videos with his dog, ice cream, about work, relatives, experimented with hairstyles. Nothing showed that he was a fan of conspiracy theories, yetis, aliens, etc. I think that's very interesting. It's true. How do you go from... And I remember seeing this picture when this came out, about that, that he had taken... It looks like a big figure on a on a ridge but I remember seeing that and how do you go from killing you know well he doesn't say killing herself I take that back there's it doesn't really say it doesn't specify what happened to him but you would think that somebody who was born in 1987 mm, all of a sudden he passes away so and from what I'm looking at he he had a family I mean besides his parents he had a child he had a children. So, I don't know. That That's that's one of those, you know what they say, no, no such thing as uh, conspiracies, but no such thing as coincidences either. All right, uh, let's go back to Erie News and um, this other one. This is like my, one of my favorites, which is true crime. And this is... Uh, 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 another um, case that's been solved by DNA forensic evidence okay and um, basically it's uh, it's uh, titled fish killed Jane Doe murdered in 1980 identified right and uh, on March 20th 1980 Thomas Newman and Stanley O'Dell Maintenance workers found a steamer trunk behind a dumpster at the Hudson View Apartments. Naturally, they assumed someone wanted it to go out with the trash. Then they noticed blood on the outside. The trunk was old green and beat up with black trim and brass fittings. There were stickers on the outside for the French Ocean Liner Flandre and others from the Cunard lines. It appeared the trunk had been tampered with because there was tape around the seams and some of it had been pulled off. The men tried to lift it but found it was too heavy. So they opened it, and inside was the nude body of a white young woman with her head and hands missing. Later, Newman told newspapers he was having nightmares. He said, I woke up in the middle of the night, and I saw the white thing with no head. Police responded to the apartment complex located off Route 9D in Fishkill, New York, about 70 miles from Manhattan. Authorities searched the wooded area nearby for the body parts, but found nothing. The corpse had been fitted into a space that measured 21 inches wide, 37 inches long, and 14 inches deep. Inside the trunk, it had blue fabric lining with no design, and it was in good condition. Troopers interviewed the occupants of the 500-plus apartment complex for any leads in the case. It was believed the trunk was left there between noon and 10 p.m. on March 18th. The body was originally examined by Dutchess County Medical Examiner Dr. John Supple, and then was autopsied by Dr. Francis McMahon at Vassar Hospital. It was estimated she was 5'3 to 5'6, weighed about 140 pounds, and had dark body hair. She wore a size 12 or 14, had a 26-inch waist, wore a size 34B bra, and had type O negative blood. Her uterus exam indicated she had not been pregnant, the ME found no marks of violence on the body. However, the head was amputated between C3 and C4 level, and the hands were amputated at the wrist joints. The head and hands were cut carefully, but not surgically. The body had been virtually drained of blood, 
and it was very clean. She had small feet about a size 4 or 5, which is unusual for a woman of that height. The trunk was traced to a Greenwich Village resident, an artist named June Leaf. She told police in 1980 that she had lost track of the trunk in 1960. The stickers corresponded to when she had crossed from New York to Le Havre, France and returned on the Cunard Lines in the 1950s. The police followed many leads and according to reports of the day they tried to match the corpse up to any missing women reports from the eastern United States. Without fingerprints or teeth to compare, the limited technology at that time did not permit any identification to be made of the remains, which is what the killer intended when they mutilated the body. However, whoever left the body there knew it was bound to be found. The case became cold, and she became known as Dutchess County Jane Doe or Fishkill Jane Doe. During those years, there were similar murders of other women. In April of 1976, this was four years before, a woman's body missing the head and one or both hands was found floating in Greenwood Lake in Warwick, Orange County, New York. Three months before fish kill Jane Doe was found, firemen were called to a fire at the Travelin Motel on the west side in Manhattan. A fireman carried a body outside and set it down, ready to administer mouth-to-mouth resuscitation. Then he realized that would be impossible because the body had no head. The hands were also missing. A second corpse was found as well, also missing the hands and the head. The women were relieved to be in their late teens or early twenties. The lower portions of the bodies had been doused with a flammable liquid and set on fire by whoever killed them. The perpetrator also took their heads and hands. Officials said the amputations had been done with surgical skill, perhaps using a scalpel. Two sets of name brand jeans, blouses and platform shoes were found neatly piled in the bathtub and a fur coat was next to one of the burning beds. The room had been rented four days before by a man who it was assumed to have been using an alias. One was later identified as a prostitute from Trenton, New Jersey. However, who committed the crime remains unknown. In 2011, the Dutchess County Jane Doe was entered into the National Missing and Unidentified Persons System known as NamUs. The FBI was able to obtain a DNA sample from the mutilated body and handed it over to a private lab which created a DNA profile for the victim. State police were able to positively identify the victim as Papalardo Blake on May 26. However, the identification was not publicly announced until now. Her full name was Ann L. Papalardo Blake, age 44. She was reported missing on March 18, 1980. She worked as receptionist at the Vidal Sassoon Salon at 160 Fifth Avenue in Manhattan and was last seen at her place of employment about 6 p.m. No one has ever been arrested in connection to Papalardo's disappearance or to the once unidentified woman who was sealed away inside a steamer trunk. Okay. And, you know, they, they, when you look at it, they were saying that back in 1980, they didn't, you know, especially without teeth or fingerprints, it was difficult. But, you know what? If they did compare uh, reports, I don't know how they couldn't come across this woman that drops out of sight after she leaves her work and she had something she had a type o negative blood that is not a common blood type so i don't know i i think and there's very little information i'm thinking they never disclosed did she have enemies she have an ex-husband you know you look up and there's virtually no information as to her background as to you know when somebody disappears you know, though, you know, this person had either a stalker, maybe a creepy neighbor or anything like that. Nothing. Uh, this body was discovered in 1980. Uh, they put out all this information, but uh, and that she was reported missing. But there's absolutely zero information about who her family was, what was going on with her or what was. Were there any suspects? Because they're saying they followed hundreds of leads, but. There's little or no information given out. So I'm going to be following up on that one. That's very interesting. All right. Um, This next story is out of the Vintage News, and it's titled The Unsolved Murder Mystery That Helped Start America's True Crime Obsession. It may seem that America's true crime obsession is new, from Ted Bundy to Charles Manson and John Wayne Gacy to Jeffrey Dahmer. There are movies, documentary series, books, and podcasts that discuss the heinous crimes, all of which are really consumed by the public. But our obsession with true crime goes back further than you might think. 
On September 14, 1922, Eleanor Mills and Reverend Edward Hall of New Jersey were murdered. What ensued was a media frenzy that pushed the case into the public eye, with many people nationwide interested in the case. The murder and trial of the mysterious witness and a romantic scandal is considered by many to be what really started America's obsession with true crime. Hall and Mills were likely two very unsuspecting victims. Hall, 41, was a well-known Episcopal minister who married one of the heiresses to the Johnson & Johnson dynasty. Frances Hall. Mills, 34, was a working-class woman who sang in the choir at Hall's church. She was married to James Mill, who was acting sexton at the church and a full-time janitor. Together, Eleanor and James had two children. The discovery of Hall's and Mill's bodies was made on September 16, 1922, in a field in Somerset County, New Jersey. A local man and his girlfriend were walking along the road near a farm when they saw what looked like a man and woman lying under a crabapple tree, a common sight for the stretch of road as it was known as Lover's Lane except for one aspect. It was evident that they were dead. They were discovered lying on their backs, having both been shot in the head. Hall once and Mills three times. Mills also had her throat cut, and as will be discovered many years later, had her tongue cut out. Apparently the bodies had been removed after their death and laid side by side. Hall had his hat placed over his head and his calling card put at his feet. The strangest part about the discovery was that there were many love letters that the pair had written to each other, which were torn up and placed between them. Apparently, there was already rumors going round that the two may have been involved given their close relationship, but the fact that they were murdered together and the presence of their love notes confirmed it to those in the town. When news of the murder broke, interest quickly grew. As it was explained by one writer, the hell, the Hall Mills case had all the elements needed to satisfy an exacting public taste for the sensational. It was grisly, it was dramatic, it involved wealth and respectability. The crime scene became a public spectacle, with vendors literally selling popcorn, peanuts, soft drinks, and balloons to the crowds. Initially, the police believed that the case would be solved quickly, with the prime suspects being the Reverend's wife and her two brothers. Two months into the case, however, they still had no evidence as to who had done it. By the time a jury was assembled, no indictment was made, and Mrs. Hall left the country shortly after, which also put an end to the case's publicity. It was reopened four years later after the Daily Mirror published repeated articles about the case and its lack of a conclusion. They also said that they had allegedly found new evidence. Of course, the resurrection of such a popular case forced it to be reopened. In 1926, Mrs. Hall and her brothers were all arrested for the murder of Mills and Hall. As if the murder trial wasn't spectacle enough, with tabloids and large papers alike sending teams to cover it, the woman who came forward as a primary witness made it even more so. Called the pig woman because she raised pigs, Jane Gibson was suffering from cancer and required constant medical care throughout the trial. She testified in the courtroom from a hospital bed that was brought to the courthouse by ambulance every day. She provided some of the most useful testimony about the Hall Mills murder during the trial. According to her, she went out on her mule after a barking dog alerted her there might be someone on her property. She saw a man standing in her field, so she went to investigate. When she got closer, she could see that there were actually four people standing at the crab apple tree. Following gunshots, one of the people fell to the ground and a woman yelled, Don't! three times. After hearing more gunshots, Gibson turned to see that a second person had fallen down after yelling, Henry. Despite the high publicity of the trial, however, Mrs. Hall and her brothers were acquitted of the murder, and the case still remains unsolved. During the trial, an effort was made to discredit the pig woman as a witness. It didn't help that her own mother sat in the front row of the gallery, bumbling, She's a liar. She's a liar. She's a liar. The jury simply chose to believe the testimony of Mrs. Hall, who was given the nickname the Iron Widow for her stoic demeanor over that of Gibson. The case has not officially been reopened since, but there have been many other theories and suspects put forward by the public. In one instance, a reporter with the Daily Mail tried to get James Mills to confess to the murder by making it appear that his wife was haunting him during a seance, but he maintained his innocence. Although the Halls Mills case is often overshadowed by sensational murders of the late 1900s, 
It was one of the most public and closely followed cases of the time. Wow. Well, that's a great story. The pig lady. And then you're, <laughs> she has her mother <laughs> saying she's, she's a liar. <laughs> that's excellent. Okay, the next story is out of Daily Mail, and it's titled, World's First Cloned Arctic Wolf is Born in China. Pup named Maya is created using a donor cell from another of its kind and an embryo that was implanted in the womb of a beagle. An Arctic wolf has been cloned for the first time by a Beijing-based gene firm that took a donor cell from a wild female Arctic wolf and combined it with an embryo that was grown inside a beagle which shares genetic ancestry with ancient wolves to ensure the process was successful. The pup named Maya was born in June, but Sinogen Biotechnology waited to announce her birth until she was 100 days old with the hopes the clone would be in good health, and it is. Arctic wolves are not endangered like other breeds, but Sinogen hopes to use this process to save other species that are at risk of extinction. Although this is a scientific breakthrough, the cloning of animals is met with controversy as activists say the animals involved suffer in surgeries necessary to obtain donor cells and transfer embryos. Another argument against the process that some see producing animals by cloning is whether this technique is violating some moral prohibition such as people are playing God for producing embryos without using fertilization. The other side of the argument believes that cloning animals is a way to save species on the brink of extinction. Regardless, Maya is deemed a milestone for the application of cloning technology. She was created through the same technique behind Dolly's sheep, the first mammal, cloned in Scotland in 1996, which is called somatic cell nuclear transfer. Dolly, however, was euthanized at six years old when she was found to have a lung tumor. As of right now, Maya is said to be in good health and is exhibiting behavior of a traditional Arctic wolf pup. Synergene Biotechnology General Manager Mi Ji Dong told the Global Times, we started the research cooperation with Harbin Polarland on cloning the Arctic wolf in 2020. After two years of painstaking efforts, the Arctic wolf was cloned successfully. It is the first case of its kind in the world. The firm embarked on this quest by constructing 137 new embryos from, unnu- from enucleated process of removing the nucleus from a cell, oocytes which is a cell in an ovary, in somatic cells followed by the transfer of 85 embryos to the uteri of seven beagles and one birth, Maya. The genetics company behind the project wants to research how to preserve animals more at risk than Maya's counterparts. However, there's still long roads ahead of them. It is relatively easier to clone canines and cats, said Ji Dong. We'll continue to work in this field in the next step we may clone rare wild animals other than canines or cats and it will be more difficult. But some of the scientific community have raised concerns specifically about the health of cloned animals and how cloning will affect biodiversity. Maya, for her part, is destined to spend the rest of her life in captivity because of her lack of socialization. Cloning animals have been the holy grail for scientists since before Dolly, but now it is becoming a way to revive species that have since disappeared from the earth. In March, scientists at the University of California, Santa Cruz, announced they had sequenced entire genomes for the dodo bird for the first time. The flightless three-foot dodo was wiped out in the 17th century, just 100 years after it was discovered on the Isle of Marodius. And in the same month, it was announced that researchers at the University of Melbourne are working to bring the Tasmanian tiger back to life by recreating the extinct species in the hope it can be reintroduced to the wild. The lab will develop technologies that could achieve the extinction of the thylacine, commonly known as the Tasmanian tiger. Scientists have already sequenced the thylacine genome, which has provided a blueprint on how to essentially build a thylacine. Thylacine Integrated Genetic Restoration Research Lab lead Andrew said, let's see, the embryo would then be transferred to a host surrogate's uterus, such as a Dunart or a Tasmanian devil. And I have my own thoughts on this, which is, you know what, it sounds very altruistic, We want to save this. We want to bring back species on the edge of extinction. And that's always how it starts. Very altruistic for better, motivated by pure, pure reasons. And it involves into something like something else. All right. I'm still very, very leery of anything having to do with cloning. And I think that they use that 
uh, to make it more palatable to people because people will say, oh, you're going to save a species? Oh, yeah, sure. And it always evolves into something else uh, where cloning will be used. Um, let's say, if, of course, if you have the money, because this would probably cost a lot of money, where if you have enough money, you could clone a human, your your human, in other words, and I've and, and I read this story back in the 1990s, believe it or not, where they would just cut out the part of the brain that basically is, in other words, leave in, leave the part of the brain in the body which you know respiration, what makes the body work, and basically, that body would become your fallback if you ever needed a transplant of some type, or oh, it's your lung, you know, liver, anything. And of course, it would cost you a lot of money. And um, it, and some people say, well, and, and I remember reading about it, and it was disturbing back in the 1990s when I read that story. But I consider it, as the time has rolled by, before it was improbable, impossible, now it's very possible. And again, I think most people, um, the way I see it is, this is a veiled way for people who are chasing immortality to justify the research all right oh yes we were doing it and then little by little then the truth comes out as far as um you know what 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 really was what was the the outcome what was the use of all the outcomes of all this research and um that rules of bioethics were totally tossed aside but anyway, guys, uh, I will be back soon with you and bringing you some more eerie news. Until then, take care.